Good. Uh, so uh, again, I wanted to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, uh, I'll be continuing uh, this discussion of this uh, averaged uh, ensemble of theories uh, that he began with. Um, again, this is based on a paper uh, with Edward Witten uh, that came out over the summer. Uh, there was the simultaneous paper by Afkami Jetty, Cohen Hartman, and Tajdini uh, that, that Tom described just now. Um, also, if there's a little bit of time at the end, um, I may briefly mention um, some ongoing work uh, with these authors uh, who I've written below. Um, uh, again, that's if we have time at the end. Uh, also, because um, you know Tom already gave a talk that covered many aspects of that theory, I think there is going to be some more time for uh, discussion. Uh, so I encourage people to go ahead and um, uh, ask questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, if you have any uh, difficult questions, uh, put them in the chat, and then uh, Tom will answer them for me. Uh, good. So um, let me begin uh, just with a recap. Um, so last episode uh, on uh, the average of free theories, um, we uh, asked the question of uh, how one should think about gravity in uh, three space-time dimensions. Of course, uh, ADS-3 gravity should, we believe, be dual to some sort of conformal field theory in two dimensions with a central charge that's determined by the ADS radius and Newton's constant. Uh, one might think, and I think this was the point of view for a very long time, that pure ADS-3 gravity, that is to say general relativity in two plus one dimensions with a negative cosmological constant, would be dual to an individual compact unitary conformal field theory. But with a more modern point of view, uh, it's natural to ask whether instead it should be dual to some ensemble of conformal field theories. And as Tom already mentioned, there are a few pieces of evidence that at least indirectly might support this point of view. Uh, the first is based on this calculation that Tom already mentioned, so uh, I'll just mention it in passing, which is that if one tries to do an honest calculation of the torus partition function of the theory, uh, by which I mean a sum over geometries with torus boundary conditions, so some sort of sum over three manifolds, uh, whose boundary is a torus, but whose interior is allowed to fluctuate. If one tries to do an honest computation of this to the best of one's ability by doing something like a sum first over saddle points that I've called G naught here, which are going to be three manifolds whose boundary is a torus, and then one augments that sum over classical saddle points by some series of perturbative corrections. So for example, a classical action a one loop action and so forth. If one tries to do this, including all of the known contributions to these uh, gravity path integrals, then you end up with something that looks like it has a continuous spectrum rather than a discrete spectrum. And although this wasn't the perspective that we had at the time when we wrote our paper uh, more than a decade ago, in retrospect, I think it's natural to ask whether this continuous spectrum arises because one is not considering an individual compact CFT, but rather an ensemble of an infinite number of compact CFTs, so that when one averages a bunch of discrete spectra, one ends up with a continuous spectrum. The other sort of indirect piece of evidence that 3D gravity might be dual to some sort of ensemble of CFTs comes from the existence of Euclidean wormhole solutions. An individual CFT partition function that's evaluated on a set of disconnected surfaces should factorize. But as Maldacena and Maus pointed out, uh, ADS-3 gra gravity has Euclidean wormholes, by which we mean Euclidean solutions that interpolate between these boundaries. And because of that, uh, it would appear that the 3D gravity partition function would not factorize. And in retrospect, again, we could potentially interpret that as coming from the fact that one is doing an ensemble average of the product of many CFT partition functions, where the failure to factorize in this ensemble interpretation comes from correlations between the uh, statistical correlations between 
the partition functions of the CFDs on two different surfaces. I don't actually know if this was uh, part of the something that Maldacena and Maus considered at the time in their 2004 paper, but certainly uh, given recent developments over the last couple of years, it's a very natural interpretation. So in order to try and investigate this, um, what we would really need then is a theory of random conformal field theories, which would play the role of the theory of random matrices in uh, the JT gravity uh, example. So JT gravity is described by an ensemble of random Hermitian matrices. And what one then needs to do is generalize this to consider ensembles of random conformal field theories. Now, a random matrix or a, a, an n by n matrix, Hermitian matrix is uniquely determined by its spectrum. So when we wish to generalize random matrix theory to a theory of random conformal field theories, we really need to start by understanding what is the analog of the data uh, uh, that defines a CFT that would be the analog of the eigenvalue spectrum of a matrix. So uh, when one talks about an, a theory of random matrices, one is essentially talking about a distribution on a space of eigenvalues. And we need to ask what is the analogous uh, question that one would be studying when one studies ensembles of random CFTs. A two-dimensional conformal field theory, or indeed a conformal field theory in any number of dimensions, uh, includes data in addition to the spectrum of the CFT. In particular, it includes not just a spectrum of, of operator dimensions and spins for the primary operators, but also some set of coupling constants, which are captured by the operator product expansion coefficients. And so the task of defining a theory of random conformal field theories then really can be thought of as a task that can be divided into three different steps. So the first thing that you would need to do is determine the allowed values of these data that define a, the set of conformal field theories. So in particular, you have to ask what are the allowed values of the spectra and OPE coefficients that are consistent with uh, unitarity and conformal invariance. Then one needs to determine a probability distribution on this data. And finally, you need to find some way of computing an average over this data and comparing to gravity in anti sitter space if you want to understand this ensemble gravity duality. Now, of course, uh, as you all well know, this is a very difficult question. Uh, you know, step one in this procedure has a name. It's the conformal bootstrap problem. Uh, so step one is to solve the conformal bootstrap, which is not something that we know how to do in general. So instead, uh, we'll do following uh, Tom's uh, beautiful talk. Um, what we'll do is what we usually do in physics and focus on uh, theories with more symmetry where hopefully these uh, questions can be answered in more detail. So in particular, uh, as Tom already uh, stated, what we'll do is consider a very simple class of CFTs which have a symmetry group that is essentially as large as possible and as simple as possible. So in particular, we'll consider CFTs with a U1 current algebra with a number of U1s that is as large as possible uh, given the central charge of the theory. And then as Tom described, there's a natural uh, moduli space of such CFTs, which has a natural probability distribution. And uh, Tom described the computation of a particular observable averaged over the space of CFTs. In his case, he was talking about the torus partition function, which encodes the spectrum of the theory. But in fact, it turns out to be possible to, in a certain sense, compute the average of any observable in the conformal field uh, on this moduli space of conformal field theories, uh, not just the torus partition function. And what we'll see is that when we compute uh, the partition function on an arbitrary surface, so here, I'm imagining a particular Riemann surface that I have denoted sigma. What we'll see is that just as in Tom's talk, it still takes the form that one would expect of some sort of gravitational path integral. So in particular, it takes the form that I described a few minutes ago, where it looks like a sum over classical solutions. That is to say, in the present case, we're talking about 3D gravity. So it looks like the sum over uh, 
uh, solutions of Einstein's equations in three dimensions, weighted by a uh, classical action augmented with a set of perturbative corrections. This theory of gravity uh, is something uh, that we might call U1 gravity. Um, it's certainly not general relativity, but with certain assumptions, uh, which I'll try and state clearly, one can enumerate all of the saddle points that contribute to the sum over geometry and compute all of the loop corrections uh, in this theory of gravity. Um, although there are some subtleties there that I hope to have uh, some time to discuss or that we could discuss during the question period. So that was uh, just a little recap of what Tom said and where I'll be going for the remainder of this talk. So I'll talk in more detail about the siegel weil formula uh, that Tom alluded to and what it has to do with averaging. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the bulk gravity interpretation now of general observables, not just the torus partition function that was described in the last talk. And then I'll end with a little bit of speculations and some conclusions, although I should more properly call this confusions uh, rather than conclusions. Um, so in particular, um, I'll try to set the record for the no most number of question marks that can be used in the final uh, set of slides of the talk. So we'll see how well I do. Good. So let's begin by thinking about averaging over moduli space. So we're considering a theory of uh, n-free bosons, uh, as Tom described. Um, the most general action for a set of n-free bosons is the one that I have written here. So here, the fields x are periodic with period 2 pi. Uh, there are n of them that are labeled by these indices, uh, p and q. And the most general action that one can write down that preserves this u1 times u1 global symmetry, which is essentially uh, the symmetry involving the translations of these x fields, uh, is given by this quadratic action that I've written here. And it's parameterized by a set of coupling constants that if one were thinking about this from the point of view of a world sheet string theory, one would call a target space metric G and a target space B field. And what we want to do is we want to think about those coupling constants as coordinates on the space of conformal field theories. That is to say, coordinates on Narain's moduli space of free boson CFTs. Now, the first thing that, so, so here, when we write down this uh, moduli space of conformal field theories, um, as Tom described, one way of thinking about this description of the moduli space as a coset is to remember that one can get from any two um, signature n comma n lattices, one can get from any one signature n comma n lattice to any other by an orthogonal transformation in O n comma n. That's why this moduli space can be thought of as a quotient of O n comma n. But the important thing that one has, has here is this duality group which is the uh, n-dimensional version of the t-duality group, the usual t-duality group that takes a uh, radius to one over radius. And this t-duality group is important because it's the thing that ensures that this moduli space has finite volume. So if one didn't quotient by t-duality, if one didn't remember that uh, two CFTs should actually be regarded as the same, if they're related by a t-duality transformation, then you wouldn't have this first factor, uh, O n comma n, uh, living in Z. And as a result, you would find a moduli space that has infinite volume. And if you wanted to interpret the measure on this moduli space as a probability distribution, then it's very important that uh, you need a finite volume. Because what you would need to do is normalize this measure so that it has uh, it, it integrates to one. And so it's very important here that we're quotienting by the t-duality group. In any case, one can easily write down the uh, metric on this moduli space. There's a unique metric which is homogeneous under the action of on comma n. 
I've written it down here. Uh, in the case we have a single free boson, it's just dr squared over r squared. One could immediately guess that this is the correct metric on moduli space, just by noting that it's the thing that's invariant under the t-duality transformation, r goes to 1 over r. And similarly, the expression that I've written down here for the metric is invariant under the n-dimensional versions of these t-duality transformations. And then when we speak of averaging a quantity over the space of conformal field theories, all we mean is integrating with respect to this measure, normalized by the volume of this space, as one would do for a probability distribution. Good. So what are the quantities that we would like to average? Well, what we would like to average is the partition function on an arbitrary surface. So I think it's believed, although I don't know if it's proven, that uh, a conformal field theory is uniquely specified by its all genus partition functions. I think this is an idea that goes back to uh, Friedan and Schenker. Uh, and so if one can compute the all genus partition functions of a theory, that essentially uniquely determines the conformal field theory. And when I mentioned earlier that there was a sense in which we could compute any observables, this is what I meant. So on a general uh, Riemann surface, uh, sigma, of some genus uh, that could be bigger than one, uh, the partition function is something that, at least in principle, is easy to write down, although in practice it might be more difficult. Remember that we're talking about a free conformal field theory. And in a free theory, uh, the partition function is one loop exact, right? So in particular, uh, if you had a free theory, then the only thing you would need to worry about is the one loop determinant, one over the square root of the Laplacian in the theory for a theory of free bosons. And indeed, in this expression for the partition function that I've written down, there's a factor which is just one over the uh, uh, determinant of the Laplace operator to the appropriate power because we have n free bosons. One has to remember, however, that we're studying compact uh, bosons that live on some target space torus. And so in addition to this one loop determinant, there's a sum over classical solutions because things can have various uh, winding modes around this target space torus. And the uh, contribution from this momentum and winding sum is given by what's known as a uh, siegel norain theta function. Um, so it's basically the standard momentum and winding sum that one is familiar with when one studies uh, the torus partition function, but now generalized to the fact that we're considering a Riemann surface of genus G. And so the momentum and winding modes uh, now uh, take a somewhat more complicated form. The exact expression for this uh, theta function is not something that you necessarily need to pay attention to. I really just want to note for you uh, what it depends on. So it depends first on the target space metric and B field, G and B. But in addition, it depends on the moduli of the Riemann surface through its period matrix. So in particular, uh, if you have a genus G uh, Riemann surface, then you have some A cycles and B cycles that live in the first homology of the surface and corresponding uh, one forms that live in the cohomology. And then the period matrix is given by the us usual formula, uh, which is the integral of the uh, one forms over uh, the cycles. So here, uh, this period matrix omega ij is the generalization of the tau parameter that parametrizes the conformal structure or the complex structure of a torus at genus 1. And the i and j indices here run from 1 up to the g, where g is the genus of our Riemann surface. One important and indeed crucial feature that I want to mention is that the one loop determinant that we're writing down only comes from small fluctuations around a given classical solution. So in fact, that's completely insensitive to where you are in moduli space. The only quantity in this expression that depends on where you are in moduli space is the Siegel-Narain theta function. 
And indeed, you can think of this theta function as a function on the product of two spaces. It's a function on uh, this moduli space, this Narain moduli space, as well as a function on what we call Siegel upper half space, which is the space of possible period matrices. That is to say the space of G by G complex matrices whose uh, imaginary part is positive definite. There's one interesting subtlety here, which is that the Siegel upper half space is not the same as the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. In general, when G is bigger than two, uh, it's going to be larger than the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And it turns out to be uh, important for this siegel weil formula that I'm going to write down that these partition functions and these theta functions can actually be defined to live on the full Siegel upper half space rather than merely just on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. I think it might be very interesting to understand whether averaging formulas of this type can be understood when one only has functions on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces, but that's not something that I'll, I'll comment on right now because I don't have very much to say. Okay. So this is the partition function. We would like to average it over moduli space. And this is given by the product of two terms. So first of all, that one loop determinant was independent of where we were in moduli space. So that just goes along for the ride. And you're left with this uh, quantity that Tom described at genus one, which is known as a real analytic uh, Siegel Eisenstein series. And it's a function of the period matrix, which is given by a sum that's quite analogous to the sum over SL2Z that Tom described in his talk uh, earlier this morning. So in particular, it's almost the formula that you would guess if I told you to generalize Tom's formula to genus G. So in particular, the uh, tau parameter that parametrizes the moduli space of genus one curves has become a period matrix, omega. Now it's a G by G matrix. So instead of taking just its imaginary part, we take the determinant of its imaginary part. We raise that to the appropriate power. And then we sum over the modular group. In the genus one case, that modular group is SL2Z. And in the higher, case, higher genus case, that modular group is a symplectic group. Okay. That is to say, it is the group that acts, the group of transformations that acts naturally on, uh, on the one cycles of the theory, which have a symplectic inner pairing, hence SP2G. Uh, and I've written down uh, an explicit formula for it here. So we just think of an SP2G matrix in block two by two form. And then the action of gamma on omega is exactly what you would expect if you were to generalize Tom's formula to higher genus. And as a result, we have an expression, a reasonably explicit expression for this Siegel-Eisenstein series as a sum over sp2g comma z. Now, how is this formula derived? If you look in the math literature on this formula, um, the derivations are rather uh, complicated. You know, Tom gave one description, uh, but if you look in the math number theory literature, um, often the derivations involve periodic numbers and stuff like that. Uh, it turns out there's a rather uh, more straightforward and I think more physics uh, oriented way of understanding this averaging formula. Uh, roughly speaking, it follows from the fact that this partition function I told you was a function on the uh, Siegel upper half space, as well as on the um, moduli space of CFTs. And it obeys a very simple differential equation. Essentially, it's an eigenfunction of the Laplacian on the space, the natural Laplacian for the homogeneous metric on this space. And this formula, I mean, it, it sort of looks a little bit random as I've written it here, but in order to understand where this formula comes from, one just remembers that the operator that moves you around in the moduli space of uh, 
Riemann surfaces is the stress tensor. And the operator that moves you around in the moduli space of conformal field theories is the U1 current. And we have a theory uh, where the stress tensor is Sugawara. So there's a relationship between the stress tensor and the U1 currents. And so it's natural that there should be a relationship between the uh, motion on uh, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces and motion on the moduli space of CFDs. And that's what this equation is. And essentially, by studying this, one can argue that um, the Eisenstein series is the only possible answer that you could get when you integrate over uh, the moduli space of conformal field theories. Good. So that's how one would compute the average partition function of a general observable in this ensemble of free conformal field theories. How then can we interpret this answer? So I remind you that as Tom uh, very nicely described, we wish to think of this as a bulk theory that is something like a U1 to the 2n gauge theory because we had a U1 to the 2n global symmetry in the boundary. And so at the level of perturbation theory, one wants to think about this as a theory that has something like U1 to the 2n, uh, U1 to the 2n uh, churn simons gauge fields. I'll notice that when I say perturbation theory, uh, I'm really lying a little bit because typically when one talks about perturbation theory, one wants a clean separation between what you think of as classical effects and what you think of as loop effects. But the number of perturbative fields here, the number of gauge fields, uh, scales like 1 over h bar. That is to say, it's n, and we're taking a large n limit, which means there's not the same sort of clean separation between uh, classical effects and loop effects that one would like. But nevertheless, uh, U1 Chern Simons theory uh, is a free theory. So it's simple enough that we can just study it on any background manifold that we choose. And that's what we're going to do. So in particular, we would like to think of a sum over geometries, where you sum over metrics. Um, here, sorry, there's something. OK, good. Uh, where you sum over metrics whose boundary is a given Riemann surface. And the simplest geometry that one could write down, whose boundary is a particular surface sigma is what we call a handle body. So what is a handle body? A handle body is the geometry that you get when you embed a surface, a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional flat space, and you look at the interior of the surface in R3. So uh, for example, uh, I've drawn a simple handle body here, which is defined by the condition that these two purple circles are contractible in the interior. And it's a fact about geometry that if you specify the conformal structure of your Riemann surface sigma, then that specifies a unique hyperbolic metric on this handle body. That is to say, a unique solution of Einstein gravity with a negative cosmological constant in the bulk. And it takes the form of a quotient of hyperbolic three space by what we call a Schottky group. So this is some discrete subgroup of the isometry group of hyperbolic space. So um, as Tom described, what we now want to do is study the perturbations of our Trin Simons gauge fields around uh, this background. And maybe this is a point where um, I can address the discussion that went on with uh, Juan and Daniel. So when we compute this uh, perturbative contribution coming from Trim simons theory, what I'm really going to write down is the dumbest possible thing. So in particular, I'm just going to write down the one loop determinant exactly as we would compute it if one were to uh, just consider a, fluctu a fluctuating U1 gauge field in the bulk uh, handle body. So in particular, it involves a one loop determinant coming from the gauge bosons, as well as some uh, numerator that essentially comes from uh, the Fadeyev-Popov ghosts. Um, there's a, a little small subtlety here 
Um, you know, but essentially this is the usual one loop determinant involving uh, Fadeyev Popov ghosts and the kinetic operator for U1 gauge fields. And then one can just go ahead and compute it because we're working on hyperbolic space. And so you can, uh, you can take a quotient and compute this using the method of images. And the answer is this quantity that I've written down here. Um, you don't really need to pay too much attention to the detailed form of this answer. There are just a couple of things that I want to emphasize. Um, the first is that um, there's a lovely paper uh, of McIntyre and Takdashan uh, following earlier work by Zograph, which shows that this particular function that I've written down here, which is a function of the moduli of the Riemann surface that lives at the boundary, uh, is actually precisely equal to one of the terms in the Eisenstein series that I wrote down earlier. So in particular, this combination of one loop determinants in three dimensions has repackaged itself into a one loop determinant in two dimensions. And in particular, to the perturbative part of the partition function of a um, free boson on the boundary. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to mention, and this gets to something that I think Tom was discussing during his talk, is that when one does this carefully, you actually find a factor here that I've written out explicitly, which is the regularized volume of this hyperbolic uh, uh, surface in the bulk. So that is the regularized volume of this handle body, which if we were studying an honest theory of gravity that had an Einstein-Hilbert term, you would interpret as the contribution of the Einstein-Hilbert action in the bulk. Here, uh, yes, please. There's a question from Juan. Please. So the, the handle body depends on a choice of cycles, right? Yes. And so is, does your first line here depend on that choice of cycles? Yes. The, the second line was something that was defined on the boundary. I, I would have thought that that doesn't depend on the choice of cycles. Yeah, there is an imp implicit, implicitly uh, in order to, um, yeah, implicitly it depends on a choice of cycles in the bulk. Okay. Um, what, the, the second line? Yeah, that's right. So, um, Yeah, it's because of the um, numerator in the second line. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope I'm not making. I'm. Ho I hope I'm. I hope I'm not making a mistake here. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Good. Thank you. Great. So. Um, Right. So the interpretation of uh, this volume factor in an honest theory of gravity would be coming from an Einstein-Hilbert term. But we see that it is effectively induced at one loop in, um, oh, thank you. I see that Edward, uh, yes, Edward has answered the question in the chat. So indeed, that determinant omega in the numerator uh, does indeed depend on just a choice of cycles. Um, good. Great. So um, in a sense, what we see is that this Einstein-Hilbert uh, action, although it doesn't appear in the theory by hand, uh, it sort of emerges when one considers the one loop uh, determinant from this uh, perturbative U1 Chern-Simons fields. And again, uh, we get back to this comment that I made earlier that because we have a number of perturbative fields that scales like one over h bar. Um, there's no clean separation between what you would call a one loop contribution and what you would call a classical action. So because we have a large n number of perturbative fields, you get a term from the one loop determinant that looks just like it came from a classical Einstein-Hilbert action. So that I think is one sort of amusing feature of uh, this theory that although you didn't know that it had to have Einstein gravity, it looks like it had Einstein gravity anyway. Okay. So for example, um, uh, for those of you uh, who um, 
have maybe have studied um, uh, these theories on a torus, uh, this renormalized volume factor um, is basically the factor that you would call Q to the minus C over 12 that uh, accounts for the negative Casimir energy uh, on the circle in the boundary and comes from an Einstein-Hilbert action uh, of empty anti de Sitter space in the bulk. Good. But what about the non-perturbative stuff? So the sum over geometries, just as in Tom's discussion, will come from the Eisenstein series. So in particular, the Eisenstein series was a sum over the modular group. And this modular group is precisely the thing that labels handle bodies that fill in our boundary. So in particular, uh, as Juan mentioned in his question, uh, a choice of handle body it essentially boils down to a choice of cycles in the bulk, namely a choice of cycles which are contractible in the bulk. But there are many different uh, possible choices of cycles. And the final answer that you get better be modular invariant. So better treat these cycles democratically. And the way that this happens in the bulk is through a sum over handle bodies. Okay. So for example, um, I told you that there was one handle body that you could get by filling in the interior of the surface sigma to get the handle body I've called Y. But there's another handle body that you could get where you fill in the exterior. Uh, so that is a handle body where the corresponding dual cycles will be contractible. The ones that I've drawn in green here. Okay. And so the sum over the modular group is interpreted in this case as a sum over handle bodies. And we should think of this as an all genus version of the black hole fairy tale story uh, that goes back to um, Dijkraaf uh, Maldesen Amor and Verlinde. So in that case, um, those authors observed that um, modular invariance of a two-dimensional CFT can be restored by uh, a sum over geometries in the bulk labeled by the modular group. And here we're describing the exact same thing at higher genus. I'll note that thinking about this analogous sum at higher genus in pure gravity um, is much more difficult in part because the pure gravity partition function is not one loop exact at higher genus. It's one loop exact uh, on the torus, but it's not one loop exact at higher genus. And so that means that before you consider non-perturbative corrections in 3D gravity, uh, you would even have to worry about perturbative corrections, which are in general not under control and quite difficult to describe. In the present case, the uh, perturbative partition function uh, you could think of it as a conformal block, just as in the pure gravity case, but it's a U1 conformal block, not a Vera Zorro conformal block. And these things are one loop exact. Okay. There is a bit of a puzzle, however, that appears, which is that naively one might think that the sum over geometries should include a sum over all uh, hyperbolic manifolds, that is to say all solutions of Einstein gravity in the bulk. And there are many other solutions of Einstein gravity, that is to say hyperbolic manifolds, whose boundary is a given Riemann surface, that are not handle bodies. And in fact, many of these solutions are very closely related to the Euclidean wormholes um, that I described at the beginning of this talk. Generally speaking, um, such solutions have uh, smaller, uh, act smaller uh, or I should say larger Euclidean action, uh, so they're exponentially suppressed. But I don't see a reason why, at least in a theory of pure gravity, they wouldn't contribute. But it turns out that in the theory that we're describing, uh, the answer is just a sum over handle bodies. I don't really have a great explanation for that, except that there are really two possibilities. Uh, one is that perhaps this theory of gravity includes a sum over handle bodies, but our theory of gravity is not smart enough to tell the difference between a handle body and a non-handle body. So secretly, the answer also includes a sum over handle bodies. Or perhaps uh, handle bodies simply don't contribute. They aren't solutions. Or there's some reason that they just their, their contributions cancel when uh, considering their contributions to the full partition function. Lex, you have five minutes. Thank you. Great. 
So five minutes is just enough time for me to fill uh, with confusions. So one remarkable thing about these siegel weiss formulas is that they work not just when the boundary is connected, but also when the boundary is disconnected. And the answer is basically uh, as simple uh, as one could hope for. Uh, if one wants to consider a boundary that is, say, a sum of two disconnect, a union of two disconnected Riemann surfaces, um, say sigma and sigma prime, then all you have to do is take as your period matrix for that Riemann surface the thing which is block diagonal and includes the period matrices of the two individual Riemann surfaces and just evaluate the Eisenstein series. Okay. So, um, in particular, if you are considering CFTs uh, on Riemann surfaces, this period matrix is the degeneration limit. Say where you took two genus two, a genus two surface and you degenerated it so that it became just a pair of tori. The result uh, still is an Eisenstein series. So for example, in the case where your boundary is a disconnected union of two tori, it'll still be a sum over SP4Z in that case, and it's not going to factorize. And one could interpret this sum over SP4Z as coming from something like a sum over Euclidean wormholes. Uh, I'll put the word wormhole in uh, quotes here because I'm a little uh, cautious um, as to the geometric interpretation of these things. Um, some of these contributions, I think, do have a clear interpretation. For example, as wormholes of the type that I've uh, drawn here, uh, but I think uh, it's not clear that they all have such geometric interpretations. Um, I'll mention that just as the one loop determinant on a handle body could be interpreted as a conformal block, I think one should also uh, interpret the contribution of the perturbative contribution around a non handle body as a different kind of block. Okay, it's not the traditional conformal block that you would get. Um, by uh, doing a pair of pants decomposition and, and considering a sum over channels, but it's what one might call a, a quasi-Fuchsian block, because that's the name uh, that one gives these sorts of geometries. For example, one could compute uh, a spectral form factor. Uh, so this is the thing that you would get if you studied the uh, correlator of two torus partition functions. Um, there's an explicit expression as an SP4Z Eisenstein series in this case. Um, and uh, you can plot it. Okay? And that's what I've done here. So here, for example, is a generic expression for the spectral form factor. Um, here I've normalized it so that we're looking at the two-point function normalized by the one-point functions. So it, at early times, uh, just approaches one. And then at late times, it approaches a constant. Uh, this constant is known as, as the plateau. Um, it relates to the fact that the individual elements of this ensemble have a discrete spectrum. And one can show that indeed it does take the expected value. Um, this was sort of guaranteed, but I think it is nice to check that at late times, um, this spectral form factor approaches the correct plateau value. The natural question one might ask is whether, uh, in addition to having a plateau, this theory has a ramp. So a linear ramp, an approach to the plateau from below that grows linearly, is associated uh, with uh, level repulsion and chaotic dynamics. Um, it does not appear that these things have a ramp. Perhaps that's not so surprising since we've started out with theories um, that you know, were not uh, chaotic, at least in the usual sense. Um, I'll note that uh, in some circumstances, you do approach the plateau from below. Uh, so this is something that I've indicated here. But as far as I can tell, uh, you don't get a linear ramp. Okay. So um, maybe uh, uh, I can uh, just take uh, a couple more minutes um, and answer a question that I think Henry uh, asked uh, last talk. Uh, so one can also uh, consider uh, higher moments of these torus partition functions. Um, it turns out something very interesting uh, and at least a priori surprising uh, happens in that case. 
which is that if you work with a fixed number of bosons, so here capital N is the number of bosons, uh, and we look at the nth moment, so here I'm looking at the little nth moment of this uh, torus partition function for n bosons. If you consider a high enough moment of the torus partition function, the sum over geometries diverges. And actually, there's a similar divergence that happens if you look at a very high genus partition function uh, at fixed central charge. So um, I don't know if we have a great interpretation for this divergence. You know, one potential uh, uh, interpretation is that theories of gravity only want to compute uh, random independent random variables. And if we were considering a very, very high genus partition function or a very, very high moment of the torus partition function that studies very refined features of the spectrum, then um, this is not something that is an independent variable uh, for you know, sufficiently high genus. And so maybe that's just not something the gravity theory wants to compute for you. It might be a little bit like if you were studying n by n matrices, then the traces of n by n matrices uh, the, you know, the trace, the moments of n by n matrices, you know, the first n moments are independent variables, but the higher moments are not. Okay. Good. Um, I will, however, mention that although the sum naively diverges, uh, it can still be defined by analytic continuation. Uh, uh, mathematicians love studying these Eisenstein series, uh, in part because they can be analytically continued beyond their naive range of convergence, much like a zeta function. Okay. Good. Um, great. Uh, so let me just end um, with lots of question marks. Um, so I think there's many uh, possible uh, open directions to go in. Uh, we could study, study other ensembles of conformal field theories. Uh, so for example, there's something that mathematicians call the theta, theta correspondence which should allow one to study other measures on the Neurane moduli space, aside from the homogeneous one. One could look at slices of moduli spaces. There are, of course, many other ensembles of conformal field theories we could talk about. Um, for example, uh, there was a, a very nice paper by, I believe, Benjamin Dyer, Fitzpatrick, and, and maybe Garari, uh, who studied uh, minimal models. Um, they didn't think about what they were doing, maybe as ensembles of minimal models. Maybe they did. but. Uh, I think that's in retrospect what they were doing. One could study symmetric products. For example, there's the, the lovely formula of Dijkraaf, Moore, Verlinde, and Verlinde for the grand canonical partition function of symmetric products, which I think may have an interpretation as an ensemble average. Um, one could study orbifolds. One could study chiral algebras. Um, there was a very nice paper by uh, Demarski and Shapir on codes and ensembles of C and CFTs related to codes. Um, one could also study chiral theories. One thing that's very interesting about chiral theories is that whereas the uh, non-chiral theories that we're considering uh, today are parameterized by a continuous moduli space, uh, chiral theories have no moduli, which means that is to say they have no uh, marginal operators. So that means that chiral theories uh, are discrete theories and they don't live on continuous moduli spaces. And so there are siegel weil formulas that allow one to average over certain chiral theories, but they're all discrete averages rather than continuous averages. So that seems uh, uh, quite distinct from what we were describing earlier. But finally, of course, um, we would like to study really chaotic theories. So I, I, I think of uh, these Narain theories as sort of being perched at the edge of being chaotic theories, but not quite chaotic. The reason why I say that is that a rational CFT is one whose central charge is less than the number of currents and has a finite number of primary operators. Uh, a generic irrational CFT will have a central charge larger than the number of currents, and it will have a density of states that grows exponentially uh, with the energy. These free theories have a central charge exactly equal to the number of currents. So they have an infinite number of primary states, but a number that goes polynomially in the dimension rather than exponentially in the dimension. So that's why I think of them as being a, a marginal case between being chaotic and integrable. So what one would really like to do is study more chaotic examples, which of course brings us to uh, the topic of 3D gravity that we began with. Right. 
Yes, please. You, I'm you, out of time. You should wrap up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will wrap up. I apologize. Okay. So, um, yeah, 60 seconds, I promise. So, uh, one would like to uh, interpret 3D gravity as an average over all CFTs. I think the most natural thing is to think of 3D gravity as an average over all CFTs of a given central charge. Uh, the problem is that any formula you write down will have lots of question marks because we don't know how to compute such an average or even to describe the space of conformal field theories uh, in any reasonable way. Um, if it is true that 3D gravity is an average over all CFTs, then this would seem to have the remarkable implication that a typical large C conformal field theory uh, is extremal uh, in the sense that Tom described in his earlier talk, which I would find quite remarkable. Um, okay, maybe, uh, you know, I did have another slide with more question marks, uh, but maybe in the interest of time, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank Alex for the very nice talk. Uh, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't get to compute the wave function of the universe, though, which is what I was going to do on the next slide. Yeah, maybe someone will ask that question. So maybe someone will ask. Yeah. Good. From, oh yes, there uh, were a few questions in the chat. Um, good. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Two very good questions. Oh, can I answer the chat questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Ahead. Good. Uh, great. So there's one question um, about quenched versus annealed. Um, yes. So um, so for example. Um, um, good. So, uh, so uh, for example, there's there's a very big difference between the log of the average of the partition function and the average of the log of the partition function. Um, uh, uh, in principle, uh, all of the tools are here in order for us to study um, the uh, average of the log of the partition function instead of the log of the average, uh, which is, is a proxy that one often studies, but which has uh, sort of bad features at low temperature. Um, you know, uh, Netta Engelhart, Sebastian Fischetti, and I um, uh, wrote, uh, studied, uh, studied uh, the average of the log of the partition function in, in JT gravity and made some comments about how one would compute it uh, using a replica trick, uh, really just repeating things that I think uh, uh, many other people knew in in different contexts. Um, and one could, in principle, do exactly the same thing here, but I don't have anything uh, terribly contentful to say uh, right now. Um, uh, the other question was about whether, is there actually a ramp? Um, I promise you, if we had found a ramp, I would have told you. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, I will mention that there are some variants of JT gravity, such as those that Clifford Johnson had described, which do have something that looks a little bit more like this, I don't know, you might call it a pseudo ramp uh, that appears at low temperatures. It's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, we looked hard, but we, we didn't really, you know, we including at very low temperature, but we weren't able to find something that looks like a linear ramp. I mean, I will mention that um, the theory of gravity that I've been discussing, um, as, as, as I think Tom also uh, emphasized, is not a traditional perturbative theory with a nice classical limit. Uh, and so maybe it's not surprising that we don't find a linear ramp. Um, or maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe uh, someone who's more of an expert on quantum chaos could comment. In any case, these are not really chaotic theories in the usual sense. So I, I don't think we should necessarily expect a linear ramp. Yes, but I guess in uh, um, so there's a question from Edward. Oh, good. Uh, I actually just wanted to make a comment, which is also I proposed something asked in the chat. So Alex explained in the talk that uh, to get the genus G average partition function, you have to sum over what he called relatively prime matrices, C and D. He didn't explain exactly what that means for two matrices to be relatively prime, but there is a natural definition, which is stated in a couple of different ways in our paper. Anyway, if the boundary is connected, these relatively prime matrices correspond to handle bodies. So 
a question asked in the chat was why not include other three manifolds, not just Handel bodies? Haven't the faintest idea, but the formula tells us that for a connected boundary, you sum over Handel bodies. If the boundary isn't connected, the Siegel Bay formula still tells you to use these relatively prime matrices CD. You can give a natural homology explanation of what that means. But they don't, I don't think they correspond to classical geometries anymore. So the formula tells you what you want to sum over, but I don't believe you can interpret them as classical manifolds. I also want to say this is apropos of something that came up more in the previous talk. There's actually no version of Chern Simons theory that completely works. So, okay, first of all, let's discuss what does work. So, when you, in the formula, okay, if the gauge group is R, why don't you get a divergence from the uh, non compact Wilson lines that will range over R? The pragmatic reason is that you just calculate that ratio of determinants on a handle body with boundary conditions that the gauge fields vanish from the boundary. So therefore, there are no Wilson lines. That, however, shows you that for general uh, three manifold, you would have trouble and get a divergence because a boundary condition, if the topology was such that you could have Wilson lines in the interior that aren't constrained by what happens on the boundary, the R theory would give a divergence. But as I said, that doesn't happen for connected boundaries because the siegel Wey formula tells you to sum only over handle bodies if the boundary is connected. However, if the boundary is disconnected, you will get into trouble in the R theory. It's explained in my paper with Alex, but perhaps it's too technical to explain now. Yeah. But you will get a non-compact Wilson line between the two boundaries that will give you nonsense. So there's actually no version of Chern Simons theory uh, that will get, give satisfactory answers in general. We claim. I mean, I think the point that Tom emphasized is also good to remember, which is that we're really viewing um, this Chern Simons theory is only defining the theory at the level of perturbation theory or around a given quote unquote classical saddle point. Yes. Great. So thank so, you. But it really, it works better, certainly, if the boundary is connected. Right. Then there's a recipe with these determinants that gives the right answer. Yeah, thank you. For... OK, uh, one more question from, uh, from Henry. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess uh, Edward partly answered my first question, which is whether you had the, uh, whether your averaging formula for multiple boundaries was just a sort of boundary thing coming from Siegel Vey, or whether you knew it's what really much more of a boundary to thing. sum over. It's really much more of a boundary thing. Um, I don't think there's a clear uh, interpretation for the individual SP4Z uh, contributions, each in terms of Euclidean wormhole. Although uh, um, I think some of them uh, you know, we wrote down one in our paper uh, that we analyzed, which does have the topology uh, that I've indicated here. Um, yeah, so, okay, I guess if it's a boundary thing, then it's just the comment, this fact that it diverges for sufficiently large numbers right. of boundaries sounds like it's just a feature of the probability distribution is that it has some power law to tail. And yeah. power law tails only have a finite number of well-defined moments. So that's right. maybe one thing you could study is... Um, the generating function of partition functions, which sure. is like having yeah. a gas of boundaries, or it's like having a yeah. brain on which space time can end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, 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 the technical issue is that these, I mean, these Eisenstein series are rather, okay, I don't want to say that, but the Eisenstein series is not so easy to study, uh, but there may be interesting things to say about things like that. Yeah. And yeah, the other question I had was about um, the whether there's a, like in these random matrix theories and so forth, there's a hierarchy of the moments or the hierarchy of the cumulants of the distribution rather. Mm -hmm. So in this theory, a, a very large N is mm -hmm. the is like the variance much bigger than the third cumulant, much bigger than the fourth cumulant and so forth, or are they? Oh, um, I don't happen to remember. Scott, do you actually, this might be something Scott knows he's raising his hand to answer. I don't actually remember. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, That's because uh, Tom was asking about the baby universe interpretation. Yeah, and, it's, no, uh, no, and it's hard to make sense, no. of, well, harder to make sense of it if, yeah, it's, one, if one there's can not a hierarchy like that. Yeah, one can compute. I mean, I have written down somewhere the variance. <laughs> um, 
I just don't remember. Here, ask me in the come up to me. You know, come up to me on Gather Town, and I'll look it up for you and tell you the answer. I just don't have to remember. Yeah, thank you. Let's ask Scott for the final question. Scott, what's the answer? Oh, I actually had a somewhat unrelated question. Uh, but we can discuss with Henry and gather yeah. down. Um, yeah, my question you was, that, um, you discussed that at any given n, uh, at sufficiently large genus, the average will diverge. Mm -hmm. um, and so you proposed some analytic continuation uh, of the Eisenstein series. Um, but even with this meromorphic continuation of the Eisenstein series, there are poles in the yeah. weight at like half integer yeah. values of s. Those are like precisely the ones relevant for, uh, you know, this ensemble of nine theories. So, what do, what do you make of that? The fact that the meromorphic continuation has poles. It's a great question. Um, I, I that is a good question. I, yeah, it, it will be relevant if one wants to compute something like the log. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, an interesting yeah. analytic structure could be a feature, not a bug. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have nothing intelligent to say, however. I don't even have anything unintelligent to say. Thank you. OK, so uh, I think that's it for this session. So let's thank Alex one more time. Thank you. Thank you to Tom uh, also. Yes, also Tom. Uh, so please continue the discussions in other town. Uh, there's a two hour break now and uh, let's reconvene in two hours. Um, Thank you.